Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the joint data science seminar at Heidelberg AI event. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Michael Bronstein today. He is a professor at Imperial College London, and um, as you may know, one of the world's leading experts on graph neural networks. He has uh, received his PhD with distinction from the Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, and then before joining the Department of Computing at Imperial, he has served as a professor at USI Lugano, Switzerland, and also held visiting positions at Stanford, Harvard, MIT, TUM, and Tel Aviv University. Um, his track record is so intimidating. Um, five ERC grants, more than 30 patents, H index of 63, two Google Faculty Research Awards, two Amazon Machine Learning Research Awards, Facebook Computational Social Science Award, Royal Academy of Engineering Silver Medal, just to name a few. Um, I saw a great keynote by Michael in middle of 2019. Uh, this eventually led to this invitation here today. I'm also following him on, on Twitter. And what I like is uh, that he also sometimes uh, shares quite some sense of humor. So I'm really looking forward to his talk today. Uh, and with this, I would like to hand over to him. Um, the questions later will be handled by Paul Yeager. Uh, so please use your respective chats. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. Really, very, 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 very uh, nice uh, introduction. So it was uh, really, it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. So. I don't know if you can see the slides. Um, yeah, so um, thanks a lot again. Uh, thanks for joining and thanks for the invitation. Um, today I would like to talk about uh, deep learning on graphs or maybe more uh, generally uh, what we call uh, geometric deep learning and uh, a little bit overview of where these methods come from, uh, what are the current challenges and what I believe to be the, the next uh, steps in this field. So maybe before we dive into deep learning or geometric deep learning, let's uh, take a step back and uh, look at an important concept that is uh, important not only in deep learning, but in machine learning in general. And this is the notion of inductive bias. So if we take a very simple uh, neural network, such as Perceptron, which is uh, probably almost 70 years old, uh, basically, what it does, it takes a, a, an input, uh, weights it by some set of learnable weights, and then passes it to an activation function. Now, this is a very simple neural network, and it, it was criticized for being unable to represent the certain functions such as XOR. But if you concatenate two such neural networks, uh, basically what is called one hidden layer, you're able to represent step functions. The moment you're able to represent step functions, you can approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. This is uh, we call, uh, what we call universal approximation property. It was uh, proven in the late 80s. And uh, in a sense, it's a, it's a very good piece of news. Basically, we can represent anything we want, more or less. The problem, of course, that uh, this is a very weak inductive bias. So when we try to apply these uh, simple neural networks to uh, real world high dimensional data, such as images, they uh, tend to fail miserably. And this was one of the reasons for the so-called AI winter that happened probably around the 70s or even before. So let me show you an example. So this is probably one of the simplest problem in computer vision, uh, uh, the problem of uh, digit classification. So we see here an image. And we want to say that this is digit three. So how do we can do it? We just uh, stack this image into a vector of pixels and feed it into such a neural network. The problem happens uh, that when we uh, allow for uh, the images to undergo some transformation. So the simplest transformation is just the position of the digit. So if I shift just by one pixel uh, this digit three, the input into the neural network will be very different. And because the neural network is completely unaware of the geometry of the structure of the image, it will have a hard time to say or to learn that this is the same digit three. So what we call shift invariance, the property that we, we want the output to be independent on the input, now has to be learned from the data. And because the data is high dimensional, uh, we need very complex architectures with a lot of parameters and uh, train, training them is really a nightmare. So, in practice, it never really works. So what happened in computer vision uh, is actually the ideas that, that, that made into, uh, into working architectures uh, of artificial neural networks came from the domain of uh, neuroscience. 
the first studies of the, the visual cortex, such as the, the seminal work of Hubel and Wiesel. And uh, these ideas of basically local uh, receptive fields were first uh, implemented by, by Fukushima in the neocognitron in 1980, and then in a more rigorous formalized way in the classical work of Jan Lekan and Cothers, what we nowadays call convolutional neural networks. So basically the idea of convolutional neural networks, we'll talk about it uh, in depth, is to take advantage of self-similar structures in images at different positions and different scales. And uh, it boils down to having local operations with shared weights that are shift equivariant. And then shift invariance is achieved by uh, means of pooling, or at least approximately. So in terms of computation, uh, the nice property of convolutional neural networks is that they have a fixed number of parameters independent on the input size. So no matter of how big the image is, we still have a fixed number of parameters. And the complexity is linear, uh, at least per layer, basically applying such filters. Again, we'll talk about it later in, uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. And this happened to be extremely nicely uh, parallelizable and mappable to, to single input uh, multiple data or SIMD architectures such as GPUs. And this is what really made uh, the, the breakthrough in computer vision about a decade ago. So if we look at these, uh, uh, at, at these architectures from the standpoint of inductive biases, we see that the success of neural networks in computer vision was from the choice of the right inductive bias. Basically, the, this uh, abandoning of the general uh, universal approximation architectures towards something that has a built-in invariance uh, that is suitable for the problem in hand. And this can be generalized. So instead of shift, we can generalize uh, uh, these architectures to groups. So there, there are several works relatively recently, in particular, the, the, the works from uh, Taco Coin and Max Welling that can generalize, for example, CNNs to rotations and other group operations. But let me show you another uh, type of data. So this is a, a molecule. And if, if you are curious, this is a molecule of caffeine. This is something that I, uh, like many of you, probably are addicted to. So this is a graph. This is a very different uh, kind, of, uh, kind of data, right? Uh, here, atoms are represented as nodes, and uh, the edges represent chemical bonds. And let's say that we want to predict some property of this molecule. Let's say the atomization energy. So this is a very, uh, very uh, standard and very important problem in, let's say, drug design. So if you have a, mo a molecule, a drug candidate, and you want to, to, to predict how it will behave in certain way, what will be its chemical and physical properties. So it is essential and crucial problem in computational chemistry. How can we do it now? Basically, we can, again, represent it as a vector of, let's say, features of the nodes of this graph and feed it into a neural network. The problem, though, is that now we have many more degrees of freedom because we don't really have a canonical way of ordering our uh, nodes uh, in a graph. If an image, at least we have some raster scan order, so we can column or row stack the image, here we can permute uh, this representation in any way. And it appears that graphs are actually a very prominent type of data. So we see them, uh, probably the, the, the most uh, important example are social networks, where uh, graphs represent relations and interactions between different users, such as on Facebook or on Twitter. But we also find graphs representing different biological interaction networks, what is called intractomes. They are also used maybe with a little bit more structure in the form of triangular meshes in computer graphics and computer vision problems, uh, functional networks and brain imaging, and, and so on and so forth. So graphs are really very uh, ubiquitous and universal models for systems of relations and interactions. So what we call geometric deep learning, actually, the term comes, well, uh, Lena mentioned the, the, my ERC grant. So I, uh, when I was writing my, uh, the proposal for my consolidator grant, I think back in 2015 or something like this, uh, I was uh, interested in uh, generalizing uh, deep learning to, to geometric data, basically uh, with some form of geometric biases. And uh, then we wrote uh, a paper with, uh, uh, with Jean Bruna, Jan Lecan, Arthur Schlamm, and Pierre van der Kainz, where we uh, tried to bring together some disparate uh, uh, works that existed at that time uh, and uh, didn't really have anything in common. So we call this uh, geometric deep learning. And you may uh, encounter other terms as well, such as relational inductive biases, or graph representation learning, or graph neural networks, which uh, is a particular implementation of, uh, of these uh, ideas. Now, the prototypical objects 
uh, I would like to consider today are graphs and manifolds. So from some standpoint, let's say of a classical mathematician, there is nothing less similar than graphs and manifolds, right? People studying them even sit in different departments or on different floors of the same building, go to different conferences, don't talk to each other, and maybe even quietly hate each other. But uh, I hope that I will convince you that at least from some standpoint, these objects have certain similarities. And I will primarily focus on graphs today. I will show uh, towards the end, if I have time, how these ideas can be generalized into uh, a broader range of objects that we call the 4G uh, four of geometric deep learning. So if we look at the difference or similarity between images and graphs, one of the uh, immediate things to observe that in an image we have very regular structure. If I take a pixel and I open a window around it, I always have a fixed number of neighbors. Not only that the number of neighbors is fixed, they also come in some fixed order. On graphs, we have a very different situation. Not only that the number of neighbors is different, and social networks are maybe a good example. There are very popular users that have millions of followers and normal uh, mortal commons uh, like, like, like myself, which have maybe a few thousands. But also, we don't have a canonical way of ordering uh, the neighbors. And as a result, the kind of invariance that we will be getting in these uh, problems will be very different. So the questions I would like to address today is how to generalize the building blocks of uh, convolutional neural networks uh, or deep learning pipelines in general to graphs. One of them is how to define something similar to convolution. Another one is how to do pooling and how to do all these computations uh, efficiently. So let me start with convolution. And again, allow me to take a step back and uh, basically question where the, where the convolution operations come from. So if you look at the convolutional layer in a, a traditional CNN neural network, essentially it is wired in a sparse way. So each output uh, receives inputs uh, from just a, a, a signal from a few inputs, right? So in this case, it's just uh, three inputs that are aggregated. The second thing that is uh, also special that the weights with which we aggregate these inputs are shared. They are always the same. So if you look at the matrix of weights that maps from the input to the output, it has this special, uh, special uh, uh, multi-diagonal structure, right? Where we have multiple diagonals and the weights are always the same on the diagonal. So these matrices have a special name. Basically, they uh, are formed by taking a vector and shifting it by one position with uh, uh, some boundary conditions. So in this case, it's convenient to think of uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions. So it's shift with wraparound. This is called a circuit matrix. And uh, convolution can be identified with circuit matrix. Uh, so it's uh, a one-to-one -one representation. Now, what do we know about circuit matrices? One of them is that circuit matrices commute. So you know from basic courses in linear algebra that matrix multiplication is non-commutative, so AB usually doesn't equal BA. Uh, for circuit matrices, this is a special case, they commute. And in particular, they commute with a special kind of uh, circuit matrix, which is the shift operator. It's uh, a matrix with a, sh a shifted identity matrix, which shifts the vector by one position. Now, this is a property that uh, very often is called shift invariance. The more correct term is shift equivariance. It means that we can first shift the signal, then convolve it, or vice versa, the result will be the same. Now, what else do we know about commuting matrices? We know that they're jointly diagonalizable. In this case, it means that we will have the same eigenvectors. And as a result, we can pick one, uh, one of the circuit matrices and uh, look at its eigenvectors, we know that all the rest of the matrices will have the same eigenvectors. And it's convenient to look at the shift operator. And what we find is that its eigenvectors form the classical Fourier basis. These are the, the complex exponentials. So we sometimes say that uh, convolution or uh, circuit matrices are diagonalized by the discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so this is how it looks like. Now, different circuit, circuit matrices have different eigenvalues. They have the same eigenvectors, but different eigenvalues. The missing piece of this picture is that the eigenvalues actually are given by the Fourier transform of this vector W that forms the circuit matrix. So here we have this duality, basically two ways of implementing convolution. We can implement it in the spatial domain as product by circuit matrix, or in the frequency domain by first applying the Fourier transform. 
then because it diagonalizes convolution, we have uh, element-wise product or product with the diagonal matrix, and then the inverse Fourier transform. And the the two operations will result in the same uh, in in the same output. So this is what uh, signal processing people call the convolution theory. Okay. So let me recap basically what we know, and I hope I am not saying anything new for you. You've seen this probably in this way or another. So convolution in spatial domain is uh, a circuit matrix. You can think of it as a local aggregation on adjacent nodes with shared parameters. And uh, this structure comes from the underlying uh, grid structure. Now, we also see that circuit matrices are diagonalized by the DFT, which are eigenvectors of the shift. And therefore, we can implement convolution in the frequency domain by first applying DFT, then element-wise product, then inverse DFT. And uh, the complexity of uh, computing it in the spatial domain, if the filter is small, is order of n. And uh, in the frequency domain is n log n, using fast Fourier transform algorithm, where for practical purposes, uh, n log n is almost as good as uh, order of n. So now we go from grids to graphs, OK? And uh, graphs, in general, we can think of them as a collection of nodes and uh, edges. So edges are ordered pairs of nodes if the graph is directed, or unordered pairs of nodes if the graph is undirected. So we can talk about neighbors, basically all the nodes that are connected by edges to a given node. And the degree of the, of the node is the size of this neighborhood. We are interested in attributed graphs, so we can attach d-dimensional features to our nodes. We can also attach features to the edges in the same way. And a particular setting of it is a weighted graph, where we have some, let's say, non-negative weights on the, on the edges. So the structure of the graph can be represented by what is called the adjacency matrix. So it's a matrix which uh, has non-zero values at positions which correspond to edges and zero elsewhere. And uh, we know that for undirected graphs, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. Now, another important uh, construction is what is called the Laplacian operator. So the Laplacian operator, what it does, it subtracts from the feature at the node i the weighted average of the features at the neighbor nodes. And uh, you can uh, you can think of it as a kind of local difference operator. So how am I different from my neighborhood? And uh, you can represent it also as um, a matrix vector uh, product. Uh, the Laplacian can be represented by this uh, sparse matrix that is given by the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix. Uh, you can use the Laplacian as a way of uh, measuring uh, the smoothness of a signal. Basically, how different the node is from its neighborhood is a way of telling how smooth the signal is on the nodes of the graph. This is what physicists sometimes call the Dirichlet energy of a signal, and it's given in uh, as a quadratic form with respect to the Laplacian. So I should say that Laplacian is a very general construction. You can define it on a lot of different objects. You can define it on manifolds. In differential geometry, it's called the Laplace Beltrami operator. You can discretize the Laplace Beltrami operator on meshes. So this is what people in computer graphics like uh, calling the cotangent Laplacian. And you can even define it on metric spaces. And for us, it will be primarily of interest how to define it on graphs. Okay, so what would be the analogy of convolution on graphs then now when we have this, uh, uh, all these notions? And we've seen that there are two approaches. We can define it in the spatial domain as local aggregation with shared parameters, or we can define it using a generalization of the Fourier transform, which we call uh, the graph Fourier transform. Okay, so let me start with this spectral formulation of the graph convolution first. Now, if I take a step back again and go back to the grid, uh, you can think of a grid as what is called the ring graph, where each node is uh, uh, attached by an edge to, the, to the, the subsequent one, and we have periodic boundary conditions, so the first node is attached to the nth node. And if you look at the adjacency matrix of this graph, surprise, surprise, it looks exactly like the shift operator that we've seen before. Right? So the idea of uh, generalizing graph Fourier transform is to use the eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix or the graph Laplacian as the analogy of the Fourier transform. And the two are equivalent on grids, right? Because they are all circuit matrices, so they are jointly diagonalizable. But on graphs, they are slightly different. And you will encounter different methods in the literature that either use the adjacency matrix or the graph Laplacian. So for undirected graphs, what is nice is that these matrices are symmetric, so they have orthogonal eigenvectors. Uh, for directed graphs, uh, the, the formulation is slightly more elaborate. 
So allow me to not to go into details, and I invite you to check the references that, that appear here at the bottom. So this is how the, the Fourier basis looks like for uh, the traditional uh, ring graph. So that's the, the, the classical uh, sines and cosines. Uh, and this is how eigenvectors uh, look like on the general graph. So this is a, a broad uh, network, I think, of the state of Minnesota in the US. So here, the red colors represent uh, positive values in the eigenvectors, and the blue colors represent negative values. And the eigenvalues can be thought of as uh, the corresponding frequencies. So this gives us a completely straightforward way of applying convolution-like operations. So in order to compute convolution of x with w, we first apply the graph Fourier transform, right? We multiply our signal x by the, uh, by the uh, graph uh, Laplacian eigenvectors. So this is uh, encoded by the matrix phi. Then we apply the filter by uh, diagonal uh, matrix multiplication, element-wise product. And then we apply the inverse Fourier transform. Okay? So, so far, it looks exactly the same. Now, the complexity, unfortunately, is significantly different. So phi is a dense matrix. So dense matrix multiplication by a vector costs us order of n squared, uh, because we don't have uh, fast Fourier uh, algorithms on graphs uh, that use the redundancy of the, the classical Fourier transform. And this is just part of the problem. Computing these eigenvectors for a graph is a complexity that is roughly order of n cube, probably a little bit less. Now, the, the application of the filter is still linear, and the inverse Fourier transform is quadratic as Bohr. So here we are at a big disadvantage compared to the, uh, to the uh, number of operations that is required in the classical case, which is order of n, or worst case, n log n. The number of parameters is also problematic. Here we have order of n. So these are the spectral coefficients of the filter, the diagonal matrix that we see here, as opposed to order of 1 that we, we had before. We also have a few nasty things, like we don't have uh, 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 spatial localization of the filters that we had on grids. Uh, the filters are isotropic, so they uh, they don't have a notion of direction. I will talk about it in a second. And probably the worst case is that the filters are dependent on the basis, and as a result, they do not generalize across uh, domains. So I cannot compute a set of filters for one graph and then apply it to another. Let me show you an example of what I mean by this. So here we have a graph, or in this case, it's a mesh. I have some signal on this graph. Let's say that I apply some filter. So that does uh, edge detection for these red blobs. So I do it in the frequency domain. I do Fourier transform, diagonal uh, matrix multiplication by the spectral coefficients of the filter, and then the inverse Fourier transform. Now I will slightly deform this graph by moving the horse a little bit. As a result, the Laplacian will change a little bit. The eigenvectors will change, actually quite significantly, especially at high frequencies. If I keep the filter coefficient the same, I will get a completely different result. So. Basically, it, it is not stable under perturbation. It doesn't generalize across uh, even very similar domains. Okay. Now, I mentioned the problem of isotropic filters. And this comes from the fact that on grids, we have canonical order of, uh, of pixels. right? I can always talk about pixel to the left, pixel to the right. So I can give them some, uh, some way of ordering them. On graphs, on the other hand, I can order my neighbors in an uh, arbitrary way. And as a result, we have uh, local permutation invariants, so there are no directions on graphs. And in fact, if you think of the Laplacian, what it does, it averages the neighbors, so it's a permutation invariant operation. So permutation uh, invariance means that we have isotropic filters. If I visualize them uh, in, uh, in the plane on a grid, they will look like concentric circles. I should say that on meshes or, or discrete manifolds, the situation is more optimistic, because indeed here we have some ambiguity. I can choose, for example, the first vertex in an arbitrary manner. But once I did it, because uh, manifolds are locally Euclidean, I can order the rest of the neighbors, let's say, in clockwise direction. So instead of permutation ambiguity here, we have rotation ambiguity. So we have way more structure on, on, on meshes or on manifolds. And as a result, we can apply uh, uh, anisotropic filters. So let us again take a step back and try to uh, look at the filtering uh, uh, process slightly differently. So we can think of it as a kind of matrix function that is applied to our matrix. And if we interpret the eigenvalues as frequencies, this uh, matrix function P, which is a scalar function, can be thought of as a spectral transfer function, so as a filter. 
And if we make it parametric with fixed number of parameters, we solve the problem of number of parameters depending on the number of vertices of the graph. If we can express this function uh, in terms of simple matrix operations, we can completely avoid the explicit computation of phi. Basically, we can write it as, for example, products of Laplacians or powers of Laplacians and so on. It is possible in this case to guarantee stability under graph perturbations. So we solve the problem of generalization across domains. And it is also possible to guarantee some form of localization, either compact support or exponential decay of the filter. So the simplest choice of such function is a polynomial. And here we have fixed number of parameters, which are the coefficients of this polynomial. And uh, we can, when we apply it to the Laplacian, basically we take just the p powers of the Laplacian, and because Laplacian is usually sparse, it is roughly order of n, right? Or more correctly, uh, order of the number of edges in the graph. So you can see uh, basically how this matrix look like. It looks like it, it is sparse. Now another thing to see is that Laplacian is a local operator. It affects only the neighbors of them. So the pth power of the Laplacian affects uh, uh, neighbors uh, p times removed. So the filters as a result will be localized to p hops on the graph. And as I mentioned, we can uh, show generalization across different graphs. And basically this approach, uh, even though it comes from spectral motivation, it can be applied to any other operators. It can be applied to adjustment symmetries, actually, which do not necessarily need to be symmetric because we don't require here any explicit eigen decomposition of uh, this matrix. So we, we are not counting on uh, orthogonal eigenvectors. So that was sp spectral graph convolution. And let us talk about uh, the spatial view, right? And again, we've seen this analogy between the adjacency matrix and the shift operator. So another way of looking at convolution is actually seeing it as a weighted combination of the powers of the shift operator, right? So we, we've seen this multi-diagonal uh, uh, circuit matrix. We can just decompose it into uh, di shifted diagonal matrices, right, with different weights that I denote here by, by W. And basically, what we can think of uh, uh, of our convolution is nothing else but the same polynomial that we've seen before. So this distinction that, that uh, in, in some references is made between spectral and spatial methods for, uh, uh, for deep learning on graphs is actually completely artificial. You see that they're completely the same. Uh, there is a very strong analogy between the uh, spatial and or duality between the spatial and the, the spectral formulation, same way as we have it in the classical case, right? That they're completely interchangeable. So here as well, uh, this is what you see. Now, a slightly more general way of thinking of it, if we have uh, d-dimensional features uh, on the nodes of the graph, we can arrange them into a matrix that is n by d, n is the number of nodes, and d is the dimension. And each row in this matrix corresponds to the feature vector that, that is attached to a node. Here is in red, for example, the features of the, uh, of the node uh, of node number six. So to this matrix, we can do two things. We can, first of all, apply some shared node-wise transformation that is uh, applied to the features at each node independently. And it, it is shared parameters. So in the simplest, in the simplest case, it is just uh, multiplication by a matrix, so it's linear transformation. It's multiplying our feature matrix from the right. And we can also do diffusion. So we can uh, aggregate information from our neighbors by multiplying these matrix from the left by either the adjacency matrix or the, uh, or the Laplacian or anything you want, right? And this is called graph convolutional networks. So this is work of Kipf and Welling that uh, basically is a particular setting of the previous polynomial filter that I showed. And uh, this is probably the simplest architecture that you can think of for uh, convolutional-like operations on graphs. So you do, for example, this uh, node-wise transformation, uh, diffusion, and then you apply some nonlinearity. And if you want, for example, to do uh, node-wise classification on a graph, you can do, let's say, two layers of such convolution and then softmax that will produce the, 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 the binary output, OK? So returning to the analogy between images and graphs, we've seen that we can define uh, an analogy of convolution. So this is exchange of information, basically this linear aggregation from the neighbors, so which is a form of message passing. Instead of local window, we have uh, 
a one hop neighborhood. Uh, we don't have constant number of neighbors. The number of neighbors is different, and we cannot order them canonically. So instead of shift invariance, we have permutation invariance. The good news is that we have linear complexity. We have a, a way of doing these operations with linear complexity. So let me say a few words about pooling. Basically, in images, pooling is just coarsening the grid and aggregating uh, uh, information in adjacent uh, pixels by some shift uh, invariant, uh, sorry, permutation invariant operation. Usually it's maximum or average. So on graphs, we actually have many ways of doing it. It's a way of coarsening the graph. It can be done, for example, by collapsing uh, the pairs of nodes and aggregating the features in them. Basically, we, this way we create a hierarchy of domains and corresponding, uh, uh, corresponding feature vectors on them. And we can interleave uh, convolutional pooling layers. The special thing in graphs is that we can actually learn the way that we do the pooling. So what we've seen so far was uh, a very simple linear convolution on graphs, right? So we, we can think of it as a, a matrix that uh, is applied to our, uh, our node-wise features. And this matrix, importantly, is independent of X itself, of the features. Now, we can do it something more complicated. We can take uh, this matrix and still make it a linear aggregation. But uh, now the, the, the weights themselves with which we aggregate can depend on the features themselves. So the first uh, architecture of this kind is, uh, was done by my PhD student, Federico Monti. And uh, we call it Monet uh, uh, from uh, Mixture Model Networks. Uh, uh, another version of this is the graph attention network, where uh, the aggregation coefficients are computed as attention weights uh, in, uh, in the graph for the uh, one-hop neighborhood. And finally, we can make this uh, aggregation a nonlinear operator that depends on the features, maybe not only node uh, features, but also the edge features. And this is what is typically referred to as message passing neural networks. So, uh, we did a work in computer graphics community on point clouds where we call this also edge convolution. So let's look at this uh, general form of message passing neural network. So it has uh, two basic operations. So we can aggregate uh, the nodes, uh, the, the features from the neighbor nodes, and we can update the node itself, right? So we have uh, node I. We uh, take a look at all the neighbors. We aggregate the information from them by some permutation invariant function. Usually it's max, sum, or mean. And then we have a function that updates the, the, the feature itself. Now, the question is, what is the right aggregation operation? And actually, it appears to be quite important. So if I look at this uh, neighborhood, so in this case, the color represents different features. So the black node is like xi, right? So my, the node that I'm trying to update. And here we have uh, these two neighborhoods uh, one has uh, two red features and one green feature. Another has one green feature and one red feature. So you see, by taking the maximum, I, I cannot disambiguate between these stars. On the other hand, if I take mean, I, I am able to disambiguate between them. If, on the other hand, I look at these uh, two structures on the, on the right, we have two green nodes and two, uh, and two red nodes. So the mean will be the same. But this can be disambiguated by the sum. So the choice of the aggregation operation appears to be quite important. And it's probably appropriate to ask the question, how powerful are graph neural networks? And this question is not straightforward, because unlike the, uh, the, the traditional setting uh, what, that we've seen, the, 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 the perceptrons, where we can talk about universal approximation property, it's uh, not even clear how you define uh, uh, the expressive power of graph neural networks because they have different, uh, they operate on different domains. So you can, uh, you can uh, ask the question of uh, basically whether they disambiguate within different graphs or whether they disambiguate within different functions on these graphs. So a way, uh, one way of formulating this problem is relating it to the question of graph isomorphism. So we say that graphs are isomorphic if there exists uh, an edge-preserving bijective function between them. So in other words, uh, if you look at their adjacency matrix, we can permute its rows and columns in a way that we get uh, an adjacency matrix that is exactly the same as of another graph. So basically, the graphs can, are the same up to uh, the numbering of their nodes. And the, it is interesting that the question of testing whether the two graphs are isomorphic, we don't even know uh, what is the theoretical complexity of it. 
So we uh, we know for sure that currently there is no uh, known polynomial algorithm, but on the other hand, it's not NP hard. So the, usually it's put in a special complexity class that is called uh, uh, GI complexity, graph isomorphism complexity. And this is a classical problem in graph theory. Actually, the, f the first attempt or the hope to have found a polynomial uh, isomorphism test uh, is due to Andrei Lehmann and Boris Weisfaller, uh, two Soviet mathematicians that, that hoped that they have found a, a polynomial uh, test algorithm. And uh, it was uh, actually disproved by a counterexample a year later. And what this uh, WL test, uh, how it is called, uh, does, it uh, does a kind of color refinement. So by color, I mean a discrete label. So you start with a graph that is colored with the same color. And then what the WL test does, it looks at the neighborhood of a node and uh, represents it as a multiset. So a multiset is a set where the uh, same element can be repeated multiple times. Basically, I look at the colors of all uh, my neighbors and the, of myself, and I hash it using an injective function. And basically, you see here that, for example, two nodes with different connectivity with different number of neighbors will result in different colors. So I refine the color. I can do it again. And here, I obtain another color. But if I do it again, I uh, now see that the, the, the color remains the same. So when the colors stop changing, we can just compute the histogram of different colors. And uh, this will be the descriptor of the graph. OK, now given another graph, I can do the same, uh, the same thing and I get another descriptor. So if these two histograms for two different input graphs are different, we can say for sure the graphs are non-isomorphic. If the descriptors are, are the same, we can say only that they are possibly isomorphic, but not necessarily. So this is a necessary but insufficient condition. But there are examples of very simple structures that uh, evade the detection of the WL tests. So for example, these pairs of graphs, one of them has uh, triangles and another one doesn't. And nevertheless, from uh, this uh, simplistic color refinement uh, standpoint, they look the same. So we say that in this case, the WL test fails. So the seminal work, uh, actually two papers by, by Shu and, uh, and Morris from 2019, showed that message passing is equivalent to color refinement for some choices of the uh, of the aggregation function. And therefore, uh, graph neural networks, or the message passing type of graph neural networks, are at most as powerful as the WL test. Now, I should say that WL test, it's not a single test. There is an entire hierarchy of WL tests, what is called KWL tests, uh, which are high dimensional, and they use uh, k-tuples of nodes instead of just pairs of nodes or simple neighborhoods. They are non-local, and they have high computational complexity, and there was a formulation of equivalent high-dimensional GNNs, uh, uh, in particular due, uh, due to Hagai Maron from Weizmann Institute in Israel. The problem, of course, is that they are computationally expensive. So the 3WL uh, equivalent G, uh, GNN has a complexity of uh, n squared in space and, and cube in complexity. So this makes this uh, good in theory, but uh, completely impractical. So what we did with the work with uh, my uh, PhD student, Yorgos Buritsas, and uh, a colleague from Twitter, Fabrizio Frasca, is uh, what we call graph subtraction network, or GSN. Basically, we know that uh, WL tests or message passing uh, neural networks cannot detect certain uh, structures. So let's help them. Let's, uh, let's pre-compute these structures. Let's count them and uh, provide them as features of the nodes. So it uh, is a kind of uh, of node encoding. So this is uh, a, po a positional or structural encoding. So there are several works that try to say that if I can disambiguate the nodes in the graph, uh, then I can do better message passing, right? Because uh, if I know, for example, uh, who my neighbors are, maybe I will I learn a different rule of how to aggregate from. So in the extreme case, this can be done in the form of random features, for example, that, that are completely unique. The problem that random features, there is no mechanism of how to uh, repeatedly do random features for different graphs. So this might be a very expressive way, but it's, it doesn't generalize well. So here we are doing structural encoding. So we are looking at the how the, the structure of the local neighborhood of a node looks like. And this is done by counting substructures of size k. And then we pass this information as an extra feature uh, in standard message passing. 
And uh, the good thing is that the architecture of the neural network itself, the training and, uh, and the inference, looks exactly like standard message passing, so it has linear complexity. There is this extra step of pre-computation that, in the worst case, uh, it takes a uh, order of n to the power k, which is as bad as high-dimensional graph neural networks. But in practice, for many structures, we uh, can count them more efficiently, or we can count them approximately by some randomized algorithms, some of which have performance bounds. Now, what do we gain in this way? What we gain in this way is that we are strictly more powerful than WL, at least with uh, uh, certain structures that are, let's say, any, anything more complex than, than star-shaped graphs. We can also have, uh, uh, we can show that we are at least not less powerful than 3WL. And this can be shown by counterexample. We can show an example of these strongly regular graphs. Uh, one of them has, for example, four clicks, and another one just has uh, only three angles. So this is probably uh, undetectable by 3WL tests. But uh, if we count these structures, we can uh, disambiguate them using uh, our uh, GSN architecture. And this can be extended to higher order graphs as well. Now, if we uh, look at uh, standard data sets, applications of graph neural networks, we know that in some cases, in some uh, domains, uh, that certain structures are uh, more prominent and more informative. Uh, for example, in social networks, clicks tend to be a prominent structure that, that is important. In chemical data sets, for example, these are cycles. Okay? And if we, uh, if we use this as an inductive bias in our uh, graph neural network, we can obtain significantly better results than, than uh, previous approaches. And let me show you the result uh, with a molecule. So here we are trying to predict some, uh, some uh, uh, properties of molecular graphs by counting structures of uh, uh, circle structures, ring structures of, of, of size k. So we see that the, the, the error drops dramatically when uh, we, when we uh, allow for structures of size 5 and 6. And uh, in fact, these are very common ring uh, structures in organic molecules. So the, the rings of size 6, for example, they're aromatic rings that also appear in uh, molecules, such as my favorite molecule of caffeine. And uh, there are many examples where uh, we can know a priori what kind of structures are uh, important and informative. So in the remaining time, let me talk a little bit about uh, what's next, what, uh, uh, what is still missing in this field. And uh, I would say that uh, I started working on uh, geometric deep learning, first uh, deep learning on manifolds and meshes and then on graphs. And I was expecting that something uh, similar to what happened in computer vision uh, will come to this field as well, a kind of revolution that will completely wipe out the existing methods. And unfortunately, this has not happened. So quite disappointingly. So we do now have uh, graph neural networks everywhere, but you cannot really point to an application and say that uh, this was uh, completely transformed or revolutionized by these nets. And I think there are several reasons why uh, this has not happened yet. One of them, uh, one of the reasons for the success of uh, convolutional neural networks in computer vision was the availability of uh, large training sets. ImageNet, for example, was uh, really what uh, allowed this breakthrough in 2012. We don't have yet anything similar uh, in, uh, uh, in graph learning, so ImageNet for graphs. One of the reasons is that uh, the problems of learning on graphs are much more varied. So we can talk about problems such as node classification, graph classification, edge prediction. And each of these problems requires different types of data and different data sets. Another problem is that uh, large graphs are usually owned by uh, companies, just a handful of companies, and they are very reluctant to release these data publicly. One of the reasons that now we have draconian privacy uh, um, laws such as the DP GDPR in Europe which uh, make it extremely hard to share uh, these data publicly. So I should say that at Twitter, we organized the Rexis Challenge uh, uh, earlier this month, where we uh, released uh, uh, the, probably the, one of the largest uh, data sets in the industry uh, uh, of interactions of uh, Twitter users with, with tweets, about 150 uh, million such interactions. Uh, and it was a headache how to uh, release this data set to be uh, compliant with the GDPR uh, uh, legislation. So now there is an effort of Open Graph Benchmark, OGB, that is spearheaded by Yuri Leskowitz from Stanford. And 
uh, this is becoming the, the de facto standard for testing graph neural networks. So I hope that this will be the uh, analogy of image for graphs. Second thing is software libraries. So this is something that was completely lacking just a couple of years ago. Now we do have uh, uh, profession, profession maintained libraries such as DGL or PyTorch Geometric. Second problem is efficiency and scalability. So uh, many of the algorithms that you find in the literature, uh, when you try to apply them in uh, large scale settings such as Facebook or Twitter graphs, they simply do not scale. Their complexity, the way that they access memory, the way that, they're, uh, the, 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 way that they're, the algorithms are designed and structured, uh, make it prohibitively uh, uh, expensive and impossible. So uh, it is relatively recently that the academic community has started looking at uh, efficient and scalable uh, graph neural network models. Another challenge is dynamic graphs. So many graphs, especially in social networks, they are actually not static, so they are not just a snapshot of uh, the user relations or interactions. They change all the time. So it's uh, good to think of them as a kind of uh, uh, stream uh, of asynchronous events that form uh, or change this graph. Another thing is uh, that uh, if we look at uh, the majority of works in uh, graph learning literature, they consider nodes and edges. So message passing mechanism is uh, uh, one example of this. But we know that in many uh, complex networks, in biological networks, in social networks, it is actually higher order structures that matter. We know that, for example, there are certain motifs or graphlets that uh, are more prominent in uh, nature, in biological or in social networks than, than, than simple, uh, in simple random graphs. So these kind of structures are not taken into account. And GSN is maybe very simplistic, I would say, even to some extent naive approach to account for these structures. But probably we really want to go beyond the message passing mechanism and extend it to, to higher order structures. Another interesting point is uh, what I call latent graphs. So in many cases, we actually we don't have the graph uh, to start with that is given in the input. This was the assumption throughout this talk. I assume that somebody gives us the graph and then we do some kind of diffusion on this graph. So in many cases, the graph is not given or maybe it is noisy or maybe it is known only partially. Or actually in some cases, we see more and more works where the uh, uh, we, we try to to decouple the input graph from the computational graph that is used uh, to do message passing and diffusion. And there are many reasons why you want to do it. One of them is what's called the information bottleneck, where you try to aggregate uh, information from a lot of neighbors. Uh, uh, you, you run into uh, an over-squashing uh, problem that, that you need to squeeze a lot of information into just a single feature vector. And there are uh, missing uh, links such as theoretical understanding, the expressive power of graph neural networks. Uh, there are uh, uh, many interesting works on this, how these uh, uh, expressive neural networks, how well they generalize. Uh, whether they are robust to adversarial attacks. So there are beautiful works, for example, from the group of Stefan Gunemann at the Technical University of Munich that uh, tries to adversarially attack graph neural networks and prove some uh, uh, certificates of robustness to such attacks, and so on and so forth. I would like to end with uh, the last thing that was probably missing uh, and uh, what prevented the uh, kind of revolution that happened in computer vision uh, uh, in this domain is the killer apps, right? So you can think that computer vision and maybe NLP and speech recognition were really the poster children, so to say, of deep learning. Uh, and uh, what would be the, the, the kind of these uh, killer apps for uh, for graphs? Um, I should say that, that the community has really recently embraced graph neural networks. So if you look at the popularity of works uh, on graph neural networks, so this is statistics from a uh, recent uh, uh, iClear conference, that this is one of the most popular topics in the field currently. Uh, and it's not uh, surprising because graphs, as I mentioned in the beginning, are really uh, ubiquitous abstract models of systems of relations and interactions, so you can apply them practically everywhere. And uh, I would argue that you, you can apply them if you look, let's say, at uh, us as people, uh, very broadly, uh, we can apply graphs to model different processes uh, that govern us uh, for, at all scales, from macro to nano, whether it's individual molecules, uh, biomolecules that, that, that exist in our body, such as proteins or drugs, whether it's uh, uh, interactions between these molecules, uh, uh, interaction networks or interactomes, or maybe social graphs, such as graphs of patients or uh, interaction graphs such as Twitter or Facebook.
let me start with this application in social science. So uh, everybody is now talking about fake news. So when uh, um, uh, um, uh, irresponsible politician tweets something on Twitter, then, then it, uh, this story is picked up without being maybe fact-checked fact and becomes uh, uh, viral and spreads. Uh, uh, this is what we call fake news, right? So uh, how, how can we detect such fake news that, that are really becoming important and, and a real threat to our society? So this is what we try to do in our startup with, uh, with, uh, that I co-founded with my students. And we tried to, to develop a graph neural network algorithm that will classify uh, fake news and distinguish them from non-fake news, whatever you, how you define it, from the way that these stories propagate on the social network, in this case on Twitter. And uh, you can see here an example of how uh, a, a piece of news spreads over Twitter very similar to uh, propagation of infection in the society, such as the, the coronavirus. And uh, our company was acquired by Twitter in 2019, so that's how I ended up at Twitter, where I direct the, the, the uh, graph learning research in the London office. So at Twitter, one of the obvious things where these methods can be applied are uh, pre-commander systems, so we can uh, create graph embeddings where we represent nodes uh, as uh, some vectors in some high dimensional space. And then, for example, we can try to build the graph back from these representations. So it's kind of uh, uh, auto encoder architecture for graphs. So these representations can be used to predict, for example, uh, uh, whom to follow or which content to, to suggest to a user. Another pretty cool uh, field where uh, graph neural networks are recently becoming prominent is high energy physics or particle physics in particular, where uh, you, you, what you see here is example from a large hadron collider where a collision of two particles creates these jets of different uh, particles that decay into each other and detected by, by uh, these huge uh, detectors of different types. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the main challenges is how to classify uh, interesting uh, events that happen in such colliders because these events happen at the rate of millions per second and they generate petabytes of data. So you cannot store all these data, you need to discard it on the fly as these events happen and uh, craft neural networks is probably the next step in doing it. And uh, I, I was involved in a collaboration with the IceCube, a neutrino observatory where we try to apply craft neural networks to detect uh, astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, now, another application, and this is probably what I consider a killer app, is the, uh, the, the problem in computational chemistry and, and design and development of drugs. So if you look at the space uh, of all possible synthesizable molecules, it is uh, extremely large. It's probably almost as large as the, the number of atoms in the universe. And uh, on the other hand, the number of compounds that we can test experimentally in the clinic is extremely small. It is very expensive and takes a lot of time to, to, to test the, the drugs. So somehow we need to mitigate, to bridge this uh, gap between uh, between the, the, the all the possible candidates and what can be tested experimentally. So this is done usually by simulation methods such as uh, uh, molecular dynamics or DFT, density functional theory, uh, are used as a kind of virtual screening for, for drugs. So graph neural networks stand somewhere at the same uh, uh, level of accuracy as DFT, but uh, several orders of, of magnitude faster. And this was uh, already an old uh, work by Justin Gilmer from DeepMind. Now there are uh, way more sophisticated architectures, more accurate methods. And I should mention earlier this year, there was a publication in Cell where uh, uh, graph neural networks were used to, to, uh, for virtual screening in uh, detecting, uh, discovering new class of antibiotics was work uh, by the group of Collins from MIT. Now, I myself had uh, an excursion with colleagues from EPFL into this domain, uh, fascinating domain of biology. And uh, we were looking at uh, using geometric deep learning methods uh, to uh, represent uh, proteins and uh, to see how they uh, bind to each other. And you see here a very famous protein complex, what is called the program death ligand, or PD-1, PDL one that plays crucial role in uh, cancer immunotherapy. And this was recognized by the Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, in 2018. So the way that it works, uh, 
usually uh, we have uh, a mechanism that prevents our immune system, the T cells, from destroying healthy tissues. And uh, this comes in the form of these PD-1, PD-L1 proteins that are expressed on the on the on the healthy cells, and they block the the, the T cells. Now, some cancers uh, tend to develop these uh, these proteins, and as a result, they become immune to the normal functioning of the immune system. So, the idea of immunotherapy is blocking one of these proteins and allow the immune system to do its job. And the key problem here is how to uh, how to uh, uh, develop, how to design a binder, a molecule that will bind to this target. And usually these targets are difficult uh, to, to, to be addressed by small molecules. So it's called undruggable. Basically, the, the interfaces do not have pockets. They tend to be flat. And that's where uh, uh, biological drugs that are based on proteins or, or peptides come into the play. So we want to design a protein that will buy, bind to another protein. And this is what we did with uh, geometric deep learning with my collaborators, Pablo Gainza and, uh, uh, and Bruno Correa in Lausanne. And uh, uh, we had the luck to appear on the cover of Nature Methods uh, in the February issue. So taking ourselves to uh, a higher level of abstraction, we can also think of drug molecules uh, as the way that they interact with, uh, uh, with proteins. Proteins are uh, really ubiquitously used as uh, uh, as drug targets, but most of the drugs that, that we find in, uh, uh, in in medical practice, they are not specific. So I think on average, uh, uh, a drug will uh, typically bind to something like 50 different proteins. Uh, so uh, as a result, because proteins interact with each other, we have about 20,000 proteins that are encoded in our gene, or exist in our body, synthesized uh, by our cells. Uh, they interact with each other. So if I disrupt one of them by basically by by binding a, a drug to them, then I can disrupt entire pathways, entire biological processes. And uh, accounting for these network effects is extremely important. And that's what we do with uh, also we can do with uh, with graph-based methods. And what we try to do with uh, collaborators from Imperial College with Kirill Veselkov is to find uh, drug-like molecules in foods. And we developed a classifier that. Uh, takes as input uh, uh, oncological drugs and tries to predict whether another molecule that, for example, comes from a plant is uh, similar and has uh, similar anti-cancer properties as FDA-approved drugs. And actually, it's not surprising because we know that many plants contain uh, contain drug molecules and actually many uh, uh, many immunotherapy or many, many cancer therapy drugs are... Uh, originally derived from natural substances. And there are many, many reasons why, why this is the case. And basically, using these methods, we uh, were able to identify food ingredients that are rich with uh, anti-cancer drug-like molecules. And uh, we call this the food map. So you can find a lot of boring and actually simple and cheap foods, such as carrots and cabbage and, and, and green tea. So I think it is. It goes without saying that it's a good idea to, to integrate this into your into your diet. I should say that take it with a word of caution because uh, what we are not accounting for are interactions between uh, between different uh, between different compounds, and this plays a crucial role because uh, uh, in uh, foods we have hundreds or maybe thousands of such molecules. And the cool part of this project, of course, because well, food is cool and food is nice, and we are collaborating with a molecular chef that that actually takes. Uh, the, the, the molecules that we discovered in food and uh, produces uh, uh, nice and uh, both aesthetically and, and tasty uh, dishes out of them. So I should say that, well, I think I'm running out of time. So one uh, last example that I will show is combinatorial drug therapy. So talking about the interactions between drugs, there was a very interesting work from Marinka Zitnik uh, uh, from then at Stanford. Now she's at Harvard. Uh, uh, predicting uh, adverse, uh, adverse uh, side effects of uh, um, polypharmacy when uh, people are administered multiple drugs at the same time. And some of these interactions can be negative. Some of them they actually can be synergistic. So uh, I'm working with uh, Mila, the, the group of Yosho Benjo in, uh, in, in Canada, as well as uh, uh, pharma startup Relation Therapeutics, where we try to find drug repositioning and combinatorial drug therapies for COVID-19. And if you think this is probably the, the, the most important cause nowadays, and it would be very uh, exciting if uh, craft neural networks are able to provide a solution for this important problem.
So last problem that I would like to mention is application in computer vision and graphics. We can use graph neural networks on meshes and manifolds, both for analysis and synthesis of objects. So this is an example of uh, uh, markerless motion capture, basically virtual and augmented reality uh, effects that you can do now on your phone. So uh, this is an example of uh, the kind of things that we can do. So here you can see uh, an application to uh, virtual avatars. So this was a work of my uh, PhD student, Dominique Coulon, in collaboration with the British startup Ariel AI, where uh, this uh, application runs in real time, or actually about 10 times faster than real time on uh, your iPhone. Um, so let me uh, uh, draw this talk towards the end. I uh, talked today primarily about graphs, a little bit uh, about manifolds, but we can really think of the 4G of uh, geometric deep learning. These are grids, groups, graphs, and gauges. And I think a good analogy is what is known in the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program of uh, the mathematician Felix Klein, which uh, provide a uniform, uh, uh, unifying framework for different uh, zoo of geometries that existed in the 19th century and was a fundamental insight in physics with the famous Noether theorem that actually showed that you can derive different conservation laws such as conservation of energy or conservation of momentum from the uh, principles of symmetry or uh, some uh, uh, some invariance. So uh, same thing probably is true for deep learning. So you can derive convolutional networks from the principle of shift invariance. You can generalize it to, to groups. So shifts are just one example of course. You can also apply to rotations. In graphs, this will be permutation invariance. And on manifolds, uh, this is an example of a non-homogeneous space, similar to, what, uh, uh, to the generalization of ideas of Klein by uh, Elie Cartan and other geometries uh, to, uh, to, to uh, non-homogeneous spaces and, and manifolds. So to conclude, I think graphs are very general abstractions, useful everywhere in a lot of uh, practical problems. And uh, what I showed today, graph neural networks in particular, are a way of capturing uh, meaningful geometric inductive biases that are suitable for graph structured data. It is really cross-disciplinary research. And uh, at least in my career, I've had the luck to work with people that otherwise I would not even meet in the same conferences, whether it's uh, protein engineers or particle physicists or uh, clinicians or even the chef. And this is very hot field in machine learning. So if for some reason you happen to be a PhD student, I think this is uh, a good topic to, to work on nowadays. There are already several success stories and uh, some first examples of industrial applications. But I think what is most important that there are many, many uh, interesting, profound, deep, uh, open questions that are still unsolved and wait to be addressed in this field. So last but not least, I would like to give credit to uh, many of my wonderful uh, colleagues and collaborators with uh, whom I've had the, the honor to be working in the past years. And thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, thanks for this excellent talk. This is Paul from Heidelberg AI. Um, I really liked your thorough introduction. Uh, and. Um, so I'm going to be moderating the questions. Please post all your questions in the chat room so I can forward them to Michael now. And maybe let me start with one question. I particularly uh, liked your introductory perspective on different inductive biases to motivate graphs and uh, neural networks. And um, so I'm, I have a question. So um, I understand that uh, if, you in the, if your input data has already this this notion of a graph or it has features that you can interpret in, uh, intuitively as a graph, it makes sense to give this inductive bias to the network to facilitate learning. Um, I, I saw some of your work on latent graph learning, particularly the one in uh, with medical application where you have kind of like a, uh, the way I understand it, uh, the standard patient classification problem where each patient has different features and you want to classify the patients. And uh, you say, let's just, um, transform this input space into a latent space and then start picking uh, the, the representation in this latent space and, and start applying our inductive bias here according to some thresholds and distances. And it, this is kind of counterintuitive to me, like um, if this representation space is already optimized towards the classification problem, 
why here why should it be help here in this latent space to now explicitly hard code any distances between representations um yeah that would be my right. question yeah, so it's, it's an, excellent, an excellent question. I think uh, you can uh, you can have multiple perspectives on this problem of latent graphs, and one of them could be very, let's say, pragmatic computational considerations, such as what is the the, the better graph to, to do message passing. I would say that I like the analogy to meaningful learning techniques. And actually, I, I've recent, uh, recently written a, um, uh, a blog post on uh, towards data science about this, basically, uh, manifold uh, learning uh, 2.0. Uh, so if you remember about 20 years ago, at least when I was a student, uh, these are very popular approaches, methods such as isomap or uh, locally linear encoding or, uh, or uh, uh, Laplace and eigenmaps and, and so on. So basically, the, these were mostly used and still used uh, quite popular uh, uh, methods for uh, data visualization. So it's nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Basically, what the, the premise of these methods is that even though your data lives in a very high dimensional space, uh, the underlying structure is uh, intrinsically low dimensional. Can, uh, uh, that's why it's called manifold learning. A good metaphor for it is that you have a, a low dimensional manifold that is embedded in a very high dimensional space, and then the data is somehow sampled from this manifold. So if you think of face images, for example, they might be million dimensional, but actually the intrinsic dimension, the number of degrees of freedom that explains them is very small. And uh, the usual blueprint for these methods was you start with this uh, set of, let's say, faces or digits or whatever, you represent its local structure, usually in the form of a graph, k nearest neighbor graph, and then you uh, try to find a low dimensional representation. Basically, you embed this uh, structure into low dimensional space by preserving something. So in isomer, for example, you try to you use multi-dimensional scaling techniques to preserve geodesic distances on on this graph. And then you can apply machine learning. Usually, it was in the form of clustering, to, to basically to detect whatever you want. Now, the, what what was unsuccessful about these methods is that the process of constructing the graph and uh, preserving some structure and doing the machine learning were completely decoupled. So you had to fine tune a lot how you construct the graph, and then uh, uh, you had to massage the the, the 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 data into some representation where the, this graph makes sense. So what I'm claiming is that now with uh, with uh, graph deep learning uh, pipelines, you can put all these stages into a single end-to-end -end pipeline. So basically, you can create, you can learn task-specific optimal representation of the data where building this graph will make sense. And you mentioned the patient uh, patient networks. Uh, sometimes, actually, uh, what we see is that the graph itself is more interesting than the downstream task. It can explain uh, your problem. It can explain your your uh, your data set. So, for example, when you try to diagnose patients, uh, uh, let's say from brain features, it is obvious for a doctor, for example, that certain uh, uh, certain structures uh, in the brain of a five years old child and a, a ninety years old adult uh, have very different interpretation, right? So. There are some some processes that that uh, that evolve with age, but the, what we would be completely abnormal in a young person, let's say. So uh, basically, the graph in this case somehow groups patients together. So it, it is maybe a little bit naive way of uh, representing similarities because this is uh, mostly homophilic type of similarity, but still, it's it's I think it's an important step towards, uh, um, in some sense, interpretable uh, uh, architectures. I agree. Thanks. Um, cool. Um, so I think Lena also has a question. Um, yeah. Um, am I? Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. A very impressive talk. Many things. Uh, I, I don't worry about your killer applications. I think once the data is there, you have a lot of killer applications. Um, I was wondering. Uh, you mentioned your your field is very cross disciplinary and. You certainly review a lot of papers and you advise collaborators, supervise students. What would you say are the most common and maybe even non-obvious pitfalls that people encounter when they start working on uh, graph neural networks? Yeah, good question. So I think um, probably, as always in deep learning, the tendency to apply uh, methods as black boxes without understanding it. I think, unfortunately, in graph learning, uh, we don't really understand when and how these methods work, or maybe more importantly, when and how they fail. 
So I think this is really the, only the beginning of understanding, for example, the, the works on expressive power. They shed light on, uh, for example, uh, which structures at all you cannot uh, you cannot detect. So it's 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 hopeless to to uh, to try to make, for example, these neural networks deeper because no matter how deep you go, you will not be able to count triangles. Let's say so. Uh, once you have this knowledge, you will not even be trying uh, some some uh, uh, some some things uh, in in a futile way. Uh, uh, and then, of course, the, the, the question is how to make uh, how to make uh, different architectures that, that can address these problems. So I would say I would say this is probably the main pitfall that that uh, probably still exists. Another pitfall is uh, testing is lacking. We still see in this community people testing the new architectures or graph neural networks on the Cora dataset, which is a, a very small citation network. It's like the MNIST data dataset. So everything works well on Cora, and the performance on this data set is not at all indicative of mm -hmm. the, the, the real strengths or, or weaknesses of an architecture. So um, uh, it's, uh, uh, now there is a, this big effort to, to, to make more interesting uh, data sets and benchmarks, and uh, I think this is, this is an important progress in the field. I would say the third thing, and this is my personal favorite, and I don't have a convincing opinion on this, uh, what paradoxically, what uh, well, and maybe a counter, counter to what I was uh, say, using in this talk, deep learning on graphs. Actually, most of the architectures are not deep; they have maybe two or three layers at most. And we actually see that depth is, in many cases, is detrimental. And uh, there are deep uh, reasons why this happens. In some cases, one of them, uh, what I mentioned, is this uh, information bottleneck. When uh, you have uh, applications where you uh, you depend on uh, long-range interactions, such as in molecular graphs, uh, the property of a molecule can depend on atoms at the very ends of, uh, of a molecular graph that might be 20 hops away. And on the other hand, the graph tends, the number of neighbors tends to grow exponentially, such as in small world uh, networks. Basically, you, you, you get into the situation where you have a lot of data that you need to squeeze into a single feature vector. Uh, this results in over squashing. So uh, how to break this bottleneck, to, at least to understand whether it exists in your problem, is important. And that's why uh, just blindly adding more layers uh, sometimes doesn't work, and you see many uh, uh, many papers that show that even with a lot of tricks, uh, deeper neural networks produce worse results than, than, than shallower ones. Mm. Thanks. All right, thanks. Um, we have a question from uh, Tim. I think this is coming from, uh, or this could reflect uh, thoughts that many, uh, many uh, people in the audience have coming from the imaging or computer vision side. So in, in computer vision, when we train an algorithm, we have different training samples, right? Different grids that we show to train on, and then we generalize to different uh, grids at test time. So how does this work uh, with graphs? Are we training on the same graph? Uh, do we have different graphs in training? Do we generalize to different graphs or inside one graph? Uh, can you maybe draw a little analogy here for the computer vision people? Right, so I think it really depends on the application because uh, in graphs uh, there is a variety of applications. You can think of problems where the graph is fixed, let's say a social network, and uh, you have a signal that changes in it, or at least approximately. You have applications such as classifying uh, molecular graphs where the graphs are different. So I think in computer vision you can, at, at least uh, some class of problems, you can say that you have a fixed grid and the signal on the grid varies. In, uh, in graph problems, uh, you can have both the signal and the domain uh, uh, different. So one of the challenges is how to make an architecture that that uh, that can generalize across different graphs. And that's why, for example, I mentioned the, 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 the positional encoding. So if you have uh, a fixed graph, such as the PPI graph, the protein-to-protein -protein interaction, so we can, uh, this is a fixed graph. So the proteins do not change uh, from my body to your body. We have all the same proteins, at least, right? at least within the same species. Now, uh, in this case, you can actually encode, uh, you can uh, enumerate the vertices and say, this is protein X, this is protein Y. If it's, for example, a molecular graph, uh, each node in this case is an atom. And of course, they are very different if you're talking about different, uh, different molecules. So the, the kind of methods that will be, you, you will be using will be completely different. So you, you, in this case, for example, you want to use, you cannot use, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some uh, some unique features, you want to use maybe some something similar to structural encoding. And the message passing algorithm needs to account for different number of nodes uh, uh, in the neighborhood and, and so on and so forth. 
All right, and I guess then if, if, if you have a problem that is within one graph, then it's kind of like a semi-supervised setup where only some nodes are labeled, and then you try to get labels for the unlabeled nodes at inference time. Right, so, so well, basically inductive and transductive settings. So in one case, you basically when you, when you do the, your, your training, you see all the graph, but you know only the labels of a few nodes. But the, the more interesting, the inductive setting, so this is the transductive setting. The inductive setting is when actually at test time there are new nodes that you have never seen before or new edges. Now, the, the, the semi-supervised or the self-supervised setting would be uh, um, what I mentioned, for example, the, 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 the graph, the node embeddings, where you try to embed the nodes of the graph in some vector space from which you can reconstruct the edges. So this is typically the, the problem of edge prediction that is used in, uh, in recommender systems. Where you you uh, you try to suggest whom to follow, for example, on the social network. All right, thanks. Um, then Tom is asking: most natural networks are sparse. Is this taken into account in a special way when performing deep learning on these graphs? It is uh, it is taken into an account, and actually, when the networks are large, uh, you must somehow sample. So so uh, really, the, 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 one of the first algorithms for scalable architectures is uh, Graph Sage uh, from uh, Will Hamilton, uh, Yuri Lesnitz, and, and, and co-authors. Uh, basically, Sage stands for a sample and aggregate. So it involves some kind of sampling of the neighborhood. So you, you are not. Uh, 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 you, you, you don't run into problems where you have a popular user on social networks such as Donald Trump with, I don't know, 50 million followers. Uh, so you don't want to uh, to aggregate from all these uh, 50 million neighbors. Uh, so you will you will sample, and it it, it appears that graph sampling actually improves the the not so it's uh, it should be used not only for computational reasons, but it actually improves performance. And there are several reasons why. One of them is the bottleneck problem. So uh, Stefan Guneman that I mentioned before uh, also had a problem that, that diffusion helps uh, uh, helps graph learning and uh, what they were uh, doing is uh, rewiring the graph. So this is uh, related to the problem of latent graphs and decoupling the, the input graph from the from the message passing graph. All right, thanks. Um, then Ulrich is asking, um, can you say more about graph coarsening pooling, especially learnable variations? Yeah, so basically this is something that doesn't have analogy in computer vision because, well, there it's agreed and you just uh, uh, you just do max pooling typically. So the coarsening, you can think of it as, uh, basically you can think of two branches of a graph neural network, right? So one produces the node features and another one produces the coarsening operator. So uh, 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 usually some uh, some sparse matrix that uh, tells you that, that I, I want to aggregate information from uh, uh, from uh, this set of nodes, so this is uh, this is uh, this is produced by by another graph neural network. What happens is that usually the signal from the downstream task is uh, is uh, insufficient, so you need to add some auxiliary losses, and uh, the, the methods differ in what auxiliary loss they uh, they use. Uh, there was a uh, uh, um, I think the, the original paper on the differentiable pooling from uh, also from the group of Leskowitz they used. Uh, some entropy loss. Uh, the more recent uh, works use something similar to, to, to graph cuts. Thanks. Then uh, Matthias is asking, uh, what are your thoughts on graph GANs? What are the key differences in networks trained adversarially having CNNs versus GCNs as core layers? Good question. So I think in general, uh, these uh, uh, generative methods for graphs. So one of the differences between images and graphs, and this is not only GANs, but, but in general, uh, autoencoder type of architectures, is that uh, in images, usually, uh, it is very easy, or at least in principle, to, to say that you have an input, right? So you encode it into some latent space, then you decode it into back into an image, and then you usually train with uh, some form of reconstruction loss, right? So you, you, you compare the input image to the output image. And in images, it's simple because you have canonical order of pixels. In graphs, it's difficult because you input a graph, into a, you encode it into a vector, then you decode it into something, and then what? You have two graphs. How do you compare them? So this is this is one of the one of the problems in let's say in uh, in uh, generating molecular graphs. Uh, I would say a bigger problem is actually that uh, molecules are not just any graph, so they have a strict set of rules. Uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that allow to generate them. So you know that certain atoms cannot connect to other atoms. So, for example, certain uh, 
uh, limitations on uh, on the on the no degree and, and, and whatnot. And the second uh, uh, issue that, that actually chemists do not think of molecules as graphs. They think of them as structures. So, uh, you, uh, and the, the, the better uh, methods for generating molecules, such as uh, junction tree auto encoders, uh, they generate graphs as structures. And it's, it's, it's a good question of actually, where do these structures come from? Can you learn them and, uh, or can you, uh, can you, uh, uh, can you uh, basically come with a, a fixed vocabulary of structures? Maybe in chemistry, we know what are the typical chemical groups that exist. Uh, maybe even further, chemists actually don't think of graphs as structures. They think of them, uh, sorry, of molecules as structures. They think of them as reactions. So it's a chemical reaction. You mix this compound with this compound with these conditions to produce this resulting molecule. So the, the, really the holy grail of the field is what is called retrosynthesis. So produce a chemical reaction that can be optimized, for example, for the yield, for the costs, for the toxic waste, and so on. That will produce the, the target molecule that has, uh, let's say, drug-like properties and binds to the target and is not toxic and is soluble and so on and so forth. We are probably far away from this, but uh, hopefully one day we'll have automatically generated drugs. That's good. Um, I would say two more questions, maybe. So uh, the first one would be, um, can edge features make up for the permutation ambiguity between neighbors? E.g., uh, on a grid, one could encode left neighbor and right neighbor by an edge feature. Can this be generalized to more general graphs? Well, uh, even uh, node features can uh, disambiguate, right? So if you have a way of uh, positionally encoding the nodes, so it can be random noise, for example. It can be uh, it can be the fiddler vector of the of the graphal Poisson, right? So it can be basically the first non-trivial eigenvector of the graphal Poisson uh, uh, allows you to enumerate your nodes. So it's not a problem to uniquely encode uh, nodes of the graph. The the problem is how to make it repeatable. So to so expressive power is a lesser problem in graph neural networks than uh, generalization. Very little is known about generalization. So it's usually a trade off between how expressive you are and how well you generate. All right. Um, and then, last question. Thank you so much. Uh, what do you think about transformer architecture for graphs? It has now been announced to be complete replacement for CNN. And in NLP, it's a de facto standard and it also the best in Kaggle molecule competition. Well, transformers are graph neural networks. So it's a generalization. <laughs> so that that's your answer. Nikita. So I have only good, only, only good things to say about transformers. Basically, they 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 are GNNs. Okay. And actually, in, in NLP now, people try to go beyond fully connected graphs and introduce some, some graph structure for maybe some side information that that uh, that uh, can improve um, the, the the quality of the, the NLP algorithms. So, so injecting some some uh, uh, some prior knowledge in the form of a graph. Uh, actually makes a lot of sense in NLP. All right. Thank you. So, yeah, that's, uh, I think we close with the questions. Um, uh, thank you so much, Michael. I think Lena would like to have some, some last words, maybe. Uh, maybe thank maybe you I give you one last question, because you mentioned the, the increase in papers on graph neural networks. So if you look at the papers that you saw this year and you had, a, you now need to make a bet on which paper will be the most impactful in say, three or five years? Can you pick one? Uh, difficult question. So uh, I, probably there are many interesting papers. I would say one that I liked in particular, uh, I'm not sure actually it was accepted to, to New York, so probably it was rejected. And uh, yeah. this is the paper of Odi Alon from Israel on, uh, on graph bottlenecks. So basically they uh, identify and exemplify this problem of over squashing and show that if you just add fully uh, connected, basically all to all layer into graph neural network, just this extremely trivial, uh, naive trick improves performance. Basically, it helps uh, 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 train deeper neural networks. I, I like it very much. Okay, thanks. So now the audience has a uh, homework to do. <laughs> Many thanks for coming. That was a great talk. Uh, gentle introduction and then really interesting applications. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Doreen. See you. Bye. Thank you.